Um, I'm Nick Parler. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, free objects, or like the here, free and libre objects, which will hopefully become clear later. Uh, I'm a principal engineer at Stack, which is a hospital company based out of London. Um, please contact me if you're interested in talking about any of this stuff further. I'd love to talk about it. Um, I'm going to try and go through fairly quickly because we don't have loads of time. Um, so what are free objects? I mean, you've probably heard potentially of free monads, other things like that. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the background of it um, and what they mean. So objects in this sense, uh, the notion of a free object, really more specifically talking about an algebra, um, which is simply a set of operations, which you would say functions, uh, with some associated laws um, over a set, uh, which again, we would normally think of as a type in Haskell, and this in Haskell we could encode as a record of these functions, um, but more commonly, um, in, you know, idiomatic Haskell, we would normally use a type class. Uh, so that's really when we say the object in free objects is really, you know, a type class, some functions over a type, and some certain set of laws uh, that uh, guarantee how those work. Now, oh yeah, sorry, and here's another example. Uh, you've probably all seen a monoid before. Um, you, know, you could encode it as a sort of record type, we would probably do a class. Um, you know, we've got a couple of simple operations, and again, we know there are monoid laws, uh, so this operation is going to be associative, um, we know how the identity is going to behave, uh, so there's a little bit of extra knowledge there that we have. So what does it mean for an object to be free? A lot of people's intuition here is that it uh, comes for free, like you can do it, you, know, you don't have to do any work. A free monad, you know, you can take whatever functor you've got, and bam, instantly it's a monad. Um, this is kind of true, and it's kind of the point of it, but it's also a little bit misleading, um, and it's not really, uh, it's not actually the etymology of where the term free comes from in mathematics, it's not why they're called free objects. Um, in the free and open source software community, uh, people often talk about the, the different kinds of free, there's free as in beer, you know, something that has no cost, you get it for free. But the other type is as free as in speech, something that is free not from cost, uh, but from constraint. Uh, so we're talking about freedom, uh, and this is really the, the, actually the notion that it's much closer to. So the original uh, mathematical uh, origination of this, and it's a little bit sort of lost to the depths of time where it came out, but the, the main idea seems to be an object that's free of relations, particularly a mathematical term we won't really go into, but what we're really talking about is something that is free from any additional knowledge, any additional constraints, or any additional functions that we have to satisfy. So uh, it's the most generic instance of an algebra. So what I mean there is that it can do everything that the algebra says you can do with this algebra, but no more. And so literally, that's the only thing it can. It means that without any additional functions, any additional knowledge of what we can do with that type, we are limited only to that algebra. So I'm going to start with free monoid, uh, which is one of the more, more, more simpler algebras. Um, to be a free monoid then, so we want something that, you know, we can define a monoid on this type and only that. So given some type, we're just going to say, somehow construct these, these sort of monoid behaviors without knowing anything else about what that monoid behavior is. Uh, so we need some type, we'll call it N here. Uh, we need to obviously be able to lift, so it's actually really a transformer on this type. So we're going to turn some type uh, into an M of A. Uh, and there obviously needs to be a monoid instance for that, so we have to go do the zero and the append. So a really simple way for us to make this type is to just turn all of this really into constructors. So we need an empty constructor because there has to be some identity, so we can create that. Uh, we can obviously append two values of this type and we still get that type. Um, and then we can lift the underlying type that we want. Um, and the monoid instance there follows then trivially, I hope. Now, this Type this set of constructors, if you squint it a little bit, hopefully looks quite familiar. Uh, if we actually rename some of these things, um, you might see this, which would be a particular form of a tree. Um, so you can think again, we've got an empty one, uh, we've got this kind of node where we compare a left and a right value, um, and we have some value at the bottom. And really what this kind of tree is, is, is really a, it's almost like an abstract syntax tree for monoid operations. Uh, you know, these are the values, and node here represents that operation, and we're constructing that expression. Now, going back to earlier, we said obviously, as well as the functions, there are laws we're aware of. So, in the case of monoids, we know they're associative. Uh, and that means that although the 
you know, the left right order matters, you know, monoids are not commutative, you can't just switch things around. Um, the associativity where the brackets are doesn't really matter. Um, so this tree, we've actually got a little bit more information than we need. Uh, and in theory, we could actually flatten it up as long as we keep that sequence. So we're not messing up the commutivity. Um, then we still have the, the information we need. Um, so we can drop this down even further uh, to this formulation, which is hopefully again very, very familiar, which is a list. Um, and so actually a list is a free monoid uh, on the type of the list. Um, and in mathematics, they, they normally would say a string. A string is a free monoid on the type of the characters underneath it because what we're doing is we're putting things together in a sequence where we haven't actually combined them yet, we haven't done anything to those values, but we say that we can combine them in this order. Now, going back then to this free model, well, okay, to be free, you really need to have two things. There's two important sides of it. So one is that obviously we can construct this free monoid um, anytime we have some kind of monoidal expression, because that's what it represents. Um, so I've kind of tried to define a type class here for how you could uh, prove that something is a free monoid. Um, so firstly, if we've got any expression where we, you know, we're going to produce some expression B, which is a monoid um, from, from some type A, and we're going to basically pass in a kind of morphism, uh, something to map that A into our type. So if we're lift it into something that's a monoid, um, then we can definitely produce our free monoid. Um, and then the other side where we're actually going to really use it is that we can interpret it. Uh, so again, uh, at this point, if we actually have a, a sort of a real monoid B that we want to use, so we're actually going to you know, define what those operations mean now, um, and, and a morphism to that monoidal type, then we can take our free monoid and kind of collapse it down to a real value. Um, and you can see here that for the list, it's fairly trivial uh, to define these. Um, so really in define, we're just, uh, we're just passing in return to lift it up into a list. Um, and the interpret, interestingly, is fold map. Um, probably some of you have used fold map uh, over a list. And really what we're doing here, and this is the interesting intuition, is that it's, we are mapping from this free monoid of list into a real monoid. So we're just taking this monoid expression, changing what the monoid actually is, um, and it all kind of magically collapses down. Um, this one, interesting, this define operation I've got at the top, another way of formulating this would be just to say, one, well, no, the free monoid is a monoid, you know, added as a superclass, um, and then actually have an explicit lift uh, function, just this, this A to B, uh, which is how a lot of free types often are encoded. Uh, but I decided to go with this formulation because I think it shows the kind of symmetry uh, between these two operations, kind of going back and forth. Um, and so the really true example here, you know, if you take a couple of things of some type A, we have no idea what type this is. We can define this really vague monoidal operation of, well, we'll take the zero, we'll add that twice, and then this. Um, and, and, you know, that is an instance of any, any type when you can say that's a monoid. Um, and then we can pull that into a list by, by using that defined function. So we're going to make this list containing this monoid expression. Now, I've kind of glossed over this a little bit, but sometimes saying, a free monoid, sometimes then the free monoid. Um, when they're talking about free structures, you'll sometimes hear one or the other. Um, and, and that can be a little bit confusing. And, and the trick here is that really both are valid. Um, there are multiple encodings potentially for any uh, free object, um, but these will be isomorphic. So you can, you can convert one to the other and back again, um, and they will be equivalent, at least from the point of view of the algebra. Uh, you know, again, depending on your structure, some internal structure might be lost. Um, but when you actually uh, pull that into a real algebra, they will be the same. Uh, and so again, this is where that formulation before, uh, we can actually say that any two types M and N, if they are free monoids, uh, then you can actually go from one to the other uh, instantly, which again, it falls out of the fact that they obviously, they are so generic, all they can do is a monoid, be interpreted in any other monoid, of course you can switch between them. So why, why is this useful? You know, this is a bit of abstract math, what's the point? Um, I mean, getting at the heart of what we're doing really is say is we're defining this expression really in the language of this algebra. And the algebra defines, defines the set of operations and useful things that we can do. So we can define this expression uh, and interpret it later by deferring this interpretation. We can interpret it more than once into different interpreters to have different results and get different information out. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit more now about uh, free applicative. Uh, free monads are probably one of the more famous types of, of free structures that people might have encountered, uh, which are, they do have their uses. But one of the, the drawbacks, unfortunately, with a free monad is that the monad structure 
uh, isn't necessarily known uh, without evaluating. You know, monads, obviously, they encapsulate this, or they embody this uh, kind of sequel dependent, uh, sequential dependency where the monadic structure of something can depend on the result of the previous monadic operation. Uh, and that means it's actually very hard to evaluate without putting in real values. Uh, with applicatives, however, although we lose that power to do that kind of uh, dynamic uh, dependencies, uh, we get the advantage that we can do static analysis. So <coughs> the structure of a free applicative is known effectively at compile time. You write the expression, you know that structure. You don't need to actually put any values in to find that out. You only need the values to get the result value. So as an example here, a very simple expression language. Uh, so we might want to have in a program um, embody some calculations that depend on resources. So two simple ones here, a file on the local file system uh, and an environment variable. So we've got a, a trivial type here with two constructors that are the two actions we really want to be able to take. Um, and then we can make a, a free applicative <coughs> over this. Uh, app here is, is a free applicative from uh, control ability free. Um, make a couple of just convenience functions here, and then we can define this expression. So we're going to do some calculation. Uh, in this case, we're just going to read a couple of files and an environment variable, and we're going to just pass them into int to make this data structure. But you can imagine this could be a more complicated, more complex uh, piece of behavior. Now, we can see it effectively described this applicative expression, and to do something with it, well, obviously, we can execute it. So we can provide uh, interpretation into a different applicative. Uh, here's the obvious one into I.O., which is we're actually going to run this, and we're going to go and hit the disk, and we're going to read the environment variables um, and get our result. Uh, that's probably what we're going to want to do eventually. Um, but because of this power of free applicative, we can interpret into other things which can be useful. So we can actually analyze this and say this is almost like a, a static analysis of a program. Uh, so again, these are definitely on, the, on some simpler examples, but uh, we have the ability to map this applicative into the const uh, applicative, so the const functor, which is applicative as long as this thing is in memory. Uh, so we're going to basically pull out some of the values in that computation without actually running it. Uh, so this is a very simple way to take any calculation of type resource uh, and pull out the files that it needs and the environment variables that it needs. So we know what it's going to access before we run it. So you can imagine that in, in some piece of software, maybe uh, it's something that's running you know, in a distributed uh, situation, maybe some of the files are remote. Uh, so you might want to, before you run a calculation, maybe pull out all the files, start pulling them over the network in the background, when they're done, run that calculation. Uh, so this gives you that ability to interpret that information uh, in a different way. So uh, that's a really quick summary. It's been a short kind of 10 minutes. Uh, hopefully that explains a little bit about the, you know, the understanding of really what a free object is, um, and at least gives you some little hints of maybe where it could be useful. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, any questions? Yep. So free monads, free applicatives, free functors, what other structures other than the things that can be derived from those things, or maybe just those things that can be derived from those things? Um, what's the most unexpected or maybe interesting thing that you've run across? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, those definitely are the most uh, common, probably, uh, typically uh, monads. Um, obviously, monads is another example that's been quite trivial, is not so interesting. Uh, one of my colleagues at work actually last week was talking about free categories. Um, so obviously a category you know, embodies the notion of composition. Um, and so he was doing some work with, uh, you know, again, kind of a little sort of DSL for certain actions. And we you know, want to kind of trivially make it clear that there is an identity and a, and a composition, um, but without having to just write that boilerplate. So it's a simple pen to do that, and then they want to interpret. Um, I mean, in mathematics, it's obviously it's a general construction. Any in theory, really, any type class that you define, you could define a free version of it. Um, and really, it's, it's any case where you would want to uh, you know, really do that interpretation into multiple outputs. Um, so it does tend to be a lot of things that represent um, kind of computations of some kind, so something where you're, you're definitely building up probably more complex values uh, from other ones. So uh, I mean, I suspect that you crawl through a, a, a category theory page of various, you know, various types. Um, Probably most of them, there will be some free constructs that might be useful. Um, whether they're practical, yeah, I don't know. Any other questions? 
Yes, I, I guess it's it's probably worth just noting that uh, the freeness of most of this is up to bottom. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a little things. Yep. Uh, you gave some examples of using them in practice. Have you personally used it in practice before or seen it used in other code bases? And if so, what was the experience like? Uh, so I have. Um, uh, I use I so I had it in a system at work. We have actually since replaced that with something else purely because of the way the whole code base was structured. Um, but it was kind of a similar basis to that of embodying uh, using free primitive to embody the resources required for something so that we can pull that out. Um, that's probably the most common one I've seen. Um, the, the actual free that gets used. I've seen a couple of libraries, particularly in Scala, are actually doing it for things like options parsing. Uh, so again, if you are doing you know, command line parsing for a program or configuration parsing, uh, you can use the kind of free applicative constructions to pull out things like default values and documentation and stuff like that. Um, that's probably the most common one I've seen. Uh, I have I've not seen but heard uh, when I was working in finance that some uh, some people were using them for uh, modeling financial contracts, uh, where again you want to you know, define how uh, a contract is priced uh, relative to certain indexes, financial values, and stuff. Uh, and again, you want to do that uh, operation of pulling out what are those dependencies without having to actually calculate anything. All right, thank you.